Thank you very much for tuning in to this Facebook chat. I have to admit that this is the first time that I've done anything so professional. <laughs> I do like the screens in the background. They, Looks good, doesn't it? <laughs> it almost looks like this is a real studio. <laughs> and I almost look like I'm a real moderator. <laughs> but I'm Frank Luntz, and I'm grateful to be here because what Doug DeVos and Amway have done is create one of the best studies that I have ever seen on the role of entrepreneurship, not just in America, but across the globe. And I know that there are a significant number of people who are tuning in right now who don't come from America. So we're going to take a look at a global perspective. Now, you have been the CEO of Amway for how long? Uh, 13 years now, since 2002. And this has been your issue from the very beginning. Why does this matter so much to you? Well, you know, the, you know, the, the whole uh, idea about the entrepreneurial spirit and how people perceive it, what they feel about it, how they see themselves doing it is critical to our business, but more importantly, it's critical to our mission. We want people to have the opportunity to be in business for themselves and, 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 and seek the opportunities that are available uh, to individuals in the best way that fits them. And so understanding this is, has been important to us. So we started out with, it was started out as a pretty small sample in Germany a number of years ago where our European uh, affiliates started to, to think about this question and develop some partnerships with the, with the universities there. And then it's turned into, well, well, it's not just a European question. Wouldn't this be a question that we would ask of uh, you know, countries around the world? And, and we've built on that and really spent a lot of time to, to try to understand what this study means and, and what attitudes are towards entrepreneurship around the world. And, and so I'll, I'll give you a real quick kind of summary, if, if you will, Frank, as we you know, kind of get started. Um, you know, the, it's basically the themes since we, begin, since we started doing this have been, number one, people really are, are positive towards entrepreneurship. They love hearing about it. They love seeing it. And, and, and the positive ratings are really, really high. And then when it comes to themselves personally, could you see yourselves doing it? Well, then there's a drop. And then it's like, well, yeah, I really, really like it. I, I might be able to see myself doing it. And, and then there's another drop when people actually do it. And so our, our curiosity is, well, what are the barriers? What happens along the way from somebody really liking this idea to, to a, a huge drop when somebody's actually willing to do it? Well, and of course, it's really all based around fear, right? It's the, you know, the fear of failure. That, that's a big one. We'll talk about that as we, we go on. It, it, it's you know, access to capital because when people think about how am I going to get money, how am I going to get capital to do it, it's a huge barrier that holds people back. Well, then, you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to support it? I've got to think through. I've got to get a product. I've got to, you know, I, I've got to do all these sorts of things to, to actually create a business and make it happen. That holds people back. And then the third element is who's going to help me? You know, is there somebody out there uh, you know, that is going to help me along the way? Is there a mentor? And, and so generally, those are kind of the three things that we've found uh, with this study since we've been doing it over the past, uh, gosh, almost seven years now, as I recall. So we're going to encourage you all to write in your questions, uh, and you can do it as part of this Facebook page. And we're going to be getting to them in a second. But if you've got specific questions, please send them in. Okay. Is there a difference in region? Is is entrepreneurship more advanced or less advanced in, in the U.S. versus Europe versus Canada versus Australia? And then talk about the non-English speaking countries and regions. Mm -hmm. Where is it most supported and where, where is the greatest trouble? Yeah, it's, it's interesting and, and you'll have to, we'll have to dive into it from there, but there are regional differences. You know, how, uh, how a society is set up or how a, a country views itself or a population views itself uh, has, a, has an impact. And, and on those three levels that we talked about, it matters. It makes a difference. Um, so, so generally, you know, generally a, a, a country like the United States would be on the positive side. Uh, is it general, number one? Uh, I'm not going to say that right now because I, I can't recall exactly from this study. Um, and, and then um, the, uh, you know, the European countries would tend to be kind of in the middle. There's a spread between them of, uh, of not only how they feel about it, but, but then can, you know, where, that, where those barriers are, where those blockages are, there's a spread there. And then if you go to Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific actually stays pretty positive with a, a slight exception uh, or a bit of an exception in Japan. 
where, um, where a number of years of economic stagnation, if you will, seems to have uh, brought that down. We're trying to understand this better with the Entrepreneurial Spirit Index uh, that, that gets a little deeper into the perceptions, into the, what, the, what impact the culture has and, and how to identify that uh, inside of a, a specific market. So I'm gonna do two linkages. One is the perception of freedom and the other is the perception of the economy. It yeah. would be my assumption that those countries that promote political freedom are also more entrepreneurial. Is that correct? Yes, I think generally that uh, when that happens, it, it's generally uh, correct. But there are some uh, differences if you look at markets like, you know, you, would, you may have a political view of uh, governments in Vietnam, governments in China, but yet there's a very, very strong entrepreneurial spirit in both of those markets. Um, and, and so so the view of a government or an outside perception of a government may be different than what's actually promoted uh, by that government in a market. So, so, it, so it, it's not, not necessarily exact as to what you might think or the perceptions that you might have. And you mentioned China. Mm -hmm. So China's had a kind of an economic reversal over the past couple of years. Has that had an effect on the perceptions of entrepreneurship and the desire for people to engage in their own business or is it basically free of economic pressure? You know, China's a great example because there's a, there's a lot of talk about China and their issues, uh, you know, right now. But the issues, let's remind ourselves, are not that they're not growing. It's just that the growth is slowing. And so they're still very, very strong. And China as a, a country is shifting um, from an export-led, kind of a manufacturing export-led uh, economy back, or not back to, but kind of shifting to a consumption-led economy. So it more is driven by their own market uh, as that economy matures. And so, uh, you know, so that transition is happening in a way where they can't quite maintain the past growth rates that they have, but the market is still very, very strong. And, and the entrepreneurial spirit and the way that they talk about the entrepreneurial spirit, the way they talk about innovation. I was just there last week, and we had, you know, kind of had a conference uh, on a, you know, the similar subject about how, uh, how they see innovation, the entrepreneurial spirit, how they see creativity as essential to their future, and, and that this is going to have to continue to, you know, to drive their economy as they kind of move away from uh, you know, uh, you know, building infrastructure, you know, creating, you know, manufacturing, exporting uh, as they transition as their economy develops. Can entrepreneurship be taught? I know that you do it as part of Amway, and that's right. a significant <laughs> component. Yeah, and yeah. you're very effective at it. But outside your organization, can it be taught in school? Can it be mentored by people? And what advice do you have for those who believe it's so essential to the economy for it to be taught. Sure, you know, um, yes it can. I think the short answer that we found in the study is uh, that that people are interested in it being taught. They, they want to hear about that. And that secondly, that universities, especially you know, uh, schools of uh, you know, higher, higher ed levels, as well as now kind of getting into the more high school or secondary uh, education levels are interested in it. Amway is involved in locally in Grand Rapids with a school um, that's teaching business principles at high school level. That's, that's trying to connect uh, you know, kids at a pretty early age to that entrepreneurial spirit. Organizations like Junior Achievement have also done this for a long time. And so the feeling is that it can be taught and that, that a big element of the teaching of it is, uh, you know, is simply making people aware, talking about the issue you know, and, and, and opening somebody's eyes to, to possibilities not only uh, you know, from a macroeconomic standpoint, but from a personal standpoint, because it gets back to self-fulfillment, independence, self-determination, you know, individual freedom. It gets back to some of those, uh, those core elements. Well, it's interesting to see whether those elements are appreciated and respected in, just for the, in the American society. Uh, I need to ask you, and it's one of the first questions that we have, what are the hurdles? You've always been an optimist. Every yes, time I've known you, you we could not be more different. You see the glass is half full, I see a broken glass, That's basically. Right. But what are the hurdles that have to be overcome 
for this to be a successful effort for the individual? Yeah. Are there policy hurdles? Are there governmental hurdles? Are there economic hurdles that we need to focus on and fix? Yeah. Well, you know, I think one of the things that we're trying to, to uh, address with the Entrepreneurial Spirit Index is uh, identifying that. What is it in the culture, in, in the atmosphere that a person is living in that either strengthens their desire to start a business of their own, to take that risk, or, or, or clamps down on it? Um, and, and so, you know, so general economic conditions, general communications about uh, economic, uh, you know, strength or opportunity uh, matter. And, and then the results matter because a lot of those communications are based on, you know, how many people, you know, are graduating and getting jobs. You know, what is the economic outlook? What is the consumer, you know, confidence uh, in the marketplace? Uh, I had an experience once where, where I did an interview and, and, and all the reporter wanted to talk about was the economic crisis. You know, what are we, what's going to happen or what's Amway doing because of the economic crisis? And, and I actually kind of had to say, it's going to be okay. <laughs> you know, I, I felt I got into a counseling session. We're going to get through it. It's going to be all right. But that sort of attitude does impact people, and it, and it holds them back. So uh, structurally, it means, you know, that your tax policy, that your regulations, that, that your ability, the ease of allowing somebody to start their own business uh, matters. And, and, you know, if you've got to get, you know, approvals from 37 different people along the way, it's hard. And if there's a structural barrier of getting access to capital, even a very small level. And so if, you know, community banks or Main Street banks in the U.S. are, are, are going away, and it's all kind of moving to, you know, to the business centers in the nation, and it's kind of moving away from Main Street, it's going to be hard. And if you have, you know, huge, you know, capital requirements and, and, and you take the, you know, the, the, the feel away from a banker to say, hey, I know you, Frank, I know you, Doug, and, and I've been watching you for a while, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a risk on you, but you build it into the, all these regulations and regulators in your bank on a regular basis, it's going to be hard to make those decisions to give somebody access to financial capital. And so those things matter. Uh, you know, policy matters. And so paying attention to policy, public policy, whether it's in the United States or anywhere else, um, those are important issues. So you often don't do this. This is in response to one of the questions. Can you be a little bit more specific about the policies that you would like to see changed? There's no politics in here. There's no partisanship. Right, right. You can be an entrepreneur no matter what political persuasion you have. But what are the policies that you would advise both in America and in other countries that would make it easier for people to start their own businesses and easier for them to succeed? Sure, sure. You, you know, I think... Um you know, I think if you go to the policy issue, I, I would tend to go more towards the regulatory area. Uh, you know, so what to, to, if you're going to help startups here and abroad, you know, what are the approvals that you need to get? It, you know, I, I remember when I moved to, you know, you know, moved to Europe a number of years ago and everybody said, you know, just to get a phone, it's going to take six months because you got to go through this and you got to go through this. You got to register with the, you know, with this place and you got to register with that place and you got to register over here. And, and it's like, oh, that's just to get a phone? So you can imagine if someone's going to start up a business, and especially if you're a small business, and now you have to comply with what a regulator is going to come through and say, okay, well, what are you doing with the two employees that you have? You know, what are you doing you know, to provide for their health insurance or for their you know, others, you know, other care and well-being? Uh, you know, you start a, a, a small shop, and you maybe have your kids working there, and somebody goes to and says, well, you know, you know, child labor laws are, you know, important and things of that nature. So I think, I, I think you, you, you need to put yourself in the mind of a small business person and, and from a regulatory standpoint of how do you, how do you find the right regulatory environment? I'm, I'm not saying you just throw everything away because you have to protect people and, there, and there's a role. But a big company like Amway, you know, we, we can have a, a, a team of lawyers identify you know, regulations. We can spend money on compliance, but if you've got a company of 50 people or less, you don't have access to that resource. You don't have enough capital to, 
to pay for that resource. And, and if somebody's coming in and trying to put you through, so the EPA comes and wonders that if, uh, you know, that, that some rain collected in the backyard of where you're, you're, you're working and now that's a waterway. You know, I know they're far out stories, but, and they don't happen all the time, but those are the sorts of issues. It, it gets down to those regulations and, it, and you, you either make it more difficult or less difficult. So there are people watching, and the next question they have is, how do they know if they've got what it takes? Sure. So what are the key characteristics based on your research and based on your experience that would tell someone that they really could succeed at this? Sure. Resilience. Uh, resilience is the first thing. You know, are, you, are you able to pick yourself up after being knocked down? This is not an easy thing. So pick any sport, pick any competition. Pick you, you want to play in the band, and, and you you got to beat out somebody else. You, you got to you're going to have your time where you get set back, and you got to move forward. Uh, you know that's that's a big one. But you know uh, you know confidence, uh, having a, a sense of confidence in your own abilities, a willingness to take risk, a willingness to kind of look out and, and see. That, uh, that there's challenges and that it is possible to fail here and that there is an option that it could end badly. But you're going to do it anyway because there's also an option that it could end well. And, and this is what you want to do. Self-fulfillment. Uh, you know, this is something that just is in me. I've always wanted to do this. I've always wanted to try this. Uh, that there's a drive, an internal drive. Those are some of the characteristics that we see uh, for those who are successful uh, as entrepreneurs. They have this idea uh, and this can-do spirit about them. There's something about, hey, I, I thought of this and, and I just got to take it to the next level. Uh, you know, and, and those are things that are hard to describe, but they're, they're characteristics of an individual that, uh, that help pull them or push them forward, drive them forward. Uh, you know, that spirit of adventure. I'm going to try something new. And I know that, that uh, people are going to laugh at me and, and people are going to think I'm crazy, but I'm going to go do it anyway. And is, is, it, is there a difference if you're 25 versus being 45? Yeah. There is. The research clearly shows, um, you know, the research clearly shows that, you know, if you're under 35, you tend to be more positive, more willing, uh, more uh, able, or, or, or not able, but more confident in your abilities to be able to take these next steps. And generally, as we tend to get older, we tend to get more focused on security and, and, and kind of holding on. And that's a, a natural aging process, but it does come out in the data uh, pretty clearly that there's a difference. You know, it's, I have a small business of my own, and what's strange is the older that I get, the more risks I'm willing to take. Yeah. So I don't know, I seem to be going in the other direction. Well, it, it, but you have the characteristics of an entrepreneur. You know, again, our survey goes and reviews a broad population, and in that population, our segment of entrepreneurs that, that have these characteristics. Once you're in that segment, then I think the, uh, the data is different. So I asked a question by an American observer. Is there a difference between an entrepreneur and a small business owner? Are they essentially the same? You know, uh, I think they're essentially, you know, essentially the same. Um, because those characteristics uh, of self-determination, of confidence, of, uh, of working through and taking risk uh, are, are all there. They may end up in different phases. The, the adventure or the risk-taking part, you know, if you reach a level of success that was your goal, you know, then that's okay. And so you've reached a level of success. You're taking care of yourself. You're taking care of your family. You have a great role in your community. You're providing a good service for those around you, whatever it may be. You don't necessarily want to go nationwide or go global. Uh, you don't necessarily want to you know, go to the next level because that was your goal. Great. You know, that's the, the, the beauty of this is that you get a chance to land wherever you want to land. Uh, and, and so I think that I, I think those characteristics are similar, but I think that the differences between somebody who drives to the next level and somebody who doesn't really is just on the goals that they set for themselves and what they really wanted to accomplish when they started. There's another question, which is about the role of communication. Some of these entrepreneurs of some of the most successful startups right now are horrible communicators. Yeah. <laughs> and they get themselves in trouble all the time when they do interviews, things go badly. Your company, Amway, has the best communicators of any company I have ever met. What is the role of communication and why 
are your people so much better than everybody else? Well, I, I think the role of communication is vital. You, you've got to tell your story. You've got to, you, you got to find a customer. You, you know, you have to you know, hire an employee probably. There's, there's something you have to do to, you know, you, you have to encourage somebody else to be part of your cause. Most of these start with that inner belief as a cause. You know, I, I have this idea. I found this product. I, I have this goal and, and you pursue it. So generally you have to find a way to talk about it. And so my advice would be that you think about it and you spend time in the communications area. So many times you dive into the workings of the business or the, of the idea, whatever it is, that, that when it comes to explaining it to somebody else, it's very difficult and we, we work on it. So one of the reasons maybe that we you know, do a little bit better from your experience is that we work on it, we think about it. We're always trying to communicate you know, about our products, about our business. Uh, to others and so it, it's something we think about on a regular basis and I would encourage uh, everybody to think through how you're going to talk about uh, about things. And I know that you guys emphasize the elevator pitch yeah. which is roughly 30 seconds that you yeah. have from when you get on the elevator to when you get off that you have yeah. a chance to explain to sure. someone. It's very tough to do. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a question from uh, one of our German viewers. They want to know your favorite success story, which, <laughs> but it can't be you. <laughs> is there one that stands out to you, something that you either saw or heard about that you really, that you still smile about today? Yeah, I, you know, I do have a, a story and it happened uh, uh, with a friend, uh, a friend that I've gotten to meet outside the Amway business, uh, actually, who, uh, who became very successful. Uh, he was living in Hamburg at the time and, um, and he, yeah, you know, I was I was talking about his business and what he did, and he was in real estate and development. He said when he saw the wall come down, he was, you know, like watching the news at night in his home, and got up and left, <laughs> and just I got to go to the east, I got to go there. And and when the reunification happened, he just said I've got to be in the middle of it. I've got to see it. I can't watch it through television. I can't watch it through a third party. I've got to live it and be there. And and so uh, and so he built his business. Uh, around that and built a success around that initiative you know and and, and so think about that if, if you if you see something and, and it clicks act on it do something about it go there you know you know, you know maybe you don't just sit and wait you know we, we had a I was at the Wall Street Journal CEO council meeting uh, you know recently and um, and they were talking about innovation, you know, what are those shower moments? You know, you're in the shower, you have this idea. Well, you might want to get out of the shower and dry off, but, but when you have that idea, act on it. Do something. And, and that, was the, that was the best part of that story to me, that he, he saw that opportunity and he wasn't going to let it go. He wanted to be in the middle of it. And, and so I think it's a, a fascinating story. I'm still sorry when I saw the wall come down and I turn on the TV and everyone's on top. I'm still sorry that I did not board a plane that night yeah. from Washington to go over, but I did get to spend three days on the one election that the East Germans had before they unified. Oh, so really? That was as close as I got. That and was, in yeah. fact, that night, you still could not get back over, that the wall was still the dividing line, and you mm -hmm. had to go back in the same way you came through. I went to the Brandenburg Gate. And I was exhausted. Mm -hmm. And I told them, there's no way I'm walking to the other gate. <laughs> you know this wall is coming down. Come on, let me through, please. <laughs> and I was the first American let through. They let you through. They let yeah. me through because they knew what history was going to bring. Yeah. Yeah. So there have been some changes over the last few years about entrepreneurship, some positive and some negative. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any changes that really stand out to you? And what's the cause of those changes? Well, again, with, as we look at the report, we're trying to dive into that a little bit. So some of the changes in attitude um, that, that seem to have happened is, is that, s that somehow there's something wrong with success. There, there seems to be that when people are successful, they get targeted. Uh, that, that, that very, um, very uh, you know, uh, popular or whether it's from a political standpoint or from a uh, 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 you know, an ideological standpoint that somehow there's something wrong with somebody being successful, that they've done something wrong. And, and it's a very interesting topic. Um, again, at the, the CEO Council meeting recently, uh, uh, they, 
they studied the difference between you know success or the income gap. And the professor that discussed it and wrote a book about it said, you know, let's have a discussion. Just because there's a gap doesn't mean there's anything wrong. He told his own personal story about how somebody, a good friend of his, had become successful, had become a professor. It was roughly the same age. And he said, well, gosh, if that person can do it, then why am I not doing it? That's what I want to do. So he changed. He, he focused on what he could do differently, and, and he became successful. And, and because of that, his children became very successful. They, they built on what he had done. So he goes, the gap itself isn't necessarily bad. The question is, is there mobility? Can people still move through? And sometimes if the discussion is only about the gap, that's not the discussion. The discussion in his view and in my view would be, let's talk about the transitions. You know, let's talk about the transitions that people can have to build themselves to go through and get to a higher level. And let's talk about the fact that some people have been successful and then they did things wrong and they failed. But that doesn't mean they're done forever. They can come back again. You know, so the story of, you know, of, my, of the Amway story before Amway started with my, with my dad and Javen Andel was they had success, they had failures. They had success, they had failures. It, it, but they never saw the failure as the end. They always found their way through. And so I think you know, when, when people attack success, that's an issue, and, and, and that is that holds people back. So I, I want to stay on that for one second because it's so relevant to what's happening in this country. How do we teach people, because it always used to be this way, that people wanted the success, that they wanted to achieve. This is the first generation to resent yeah. those who are successful. This did not exist yeah. in the Depression, did not exist in the recessions in the 40s and 60s, and as recently as 2000. Something bad has happened here. How do we reverse it? Well, I think there's, uh, uh, there's a, a disconnect between a lot of things that are talked about nationally uh, through, through national media um, and, and the experience that people have. It's why people like their congressmen, but they hate Congress. It's people that, why, you know, they love their local business, but they, you know, they don't like, you know, big business. They love their, you know, their local CEOs of their small, medium-sized businesses, but they don't like CEOs. They, you know, they you know, like their local banker, but they don't like big banks. You, you know, there's something about that element, you know, that gap, you know, between what they see and what they like, and, and then, you know, and, and then, you know, you know, the, the perception of what they then watch through media or see kind of reflected on them. So then the goal is to localize success, to show people how it benefits the community? Well, I, th I think the, the goal is that to believe what you see. You know, when you see, you know, success happening around you and you see, you know, the, the, the local, you know, restaurant or something supporting the local kids' sports team or school or doing something in the community, that's what business is. That's what success looks like. When you see paraded around some, you know, somebody who's done something bad to manipulate an interest rate so they could gain you know, millions of dollars on a transaction. And that's, that's an a exception. Does that happen? Sure. Do things go wrong? Sure. But that's not the reality of business that happens throughout this country and around the world. The reality is that 99% of all that activity are from people who are just trying to do something well, take care of their families, serve their customers, and, and, and play a good role in their community. You know, when, when I drive around Michigan, especially as you kind of get outside, even Grand Rapids is not a big place, but when you get outside in rural areas, you see you know, different companies, a, a restaurant, a manufacturing facility, a distribution facility, and, and you just think of what's happening there. And, and it may be 20, 30, 50 people working in this facility, but they all know each other. You know, the idea that there's a, a, a heartless CEO that wants to fire everybody just to make more money is ridiculous. He knows those people. He lives with those people. They're family to him. The idea of, of telling somebody that they're losing a job breaks his heart. The CEO, the owner of that business, it, it can't sleep for weeks when that realization comes to them. You know, that's what business is about. 
you know, in, in our situation at, at Amway in Ada, Michigan, it's a small town. You know, we have you know, we have more employees at Amway in Ada than there are citizens in Ada. It's a small town outside of Grand Rapids, Michigan. I've been there. You, you've been there. I yeah. sneezed and it, I was out of the town already. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? But when I grew up, I went to school with the kids of that worked at Amway. I, you know, we knew each other. We grew up together. We, you know, you're part of a small community. There's no heartless feelings in business operations. If anything, it's quite the opposite. People care about their customers. They care about their product. They care about their service, and they care about their employees. And so that's the reality. What you see maybe on a national media about a heartless person who's you know, you know, wiping people out or, or you know, taking jobs away or, or doing something else, that's not the reality. Uh, sometimes in business where you know, a business fails, those things happen. A business fails. It went wrong for whatever reason. But, but the idea is that somebody else can maybe pick it up and take it to another level. You know? So there are successes, there are failures, there are tough times, there are challenges. But the heart of people who lead the majority of businesses around this country and around the world it, it is really good. So we've got a question from India. What should we do? What is our role for advancing successful entre entrepreneurship? The culture is different. The, the, the situation's different, the economy's different. Are the things necessary to succeed in India different as a result? Sure. You, you know, um, the characteristics of the individual, what we've found in our experience with Amway, and I think what the study shows, is that there are more similarities than differences. That the entrepreneurial spirit looks very similar around the world, that, that spirit, the characteristics that people need to have looks very similar. And that's been our experience at Amway too. We've seen that come through. Now, how it has to operate and, and how you have to meet the needs of the market are very different. So our product lines are different. Our promotional plans are different. Our, our uh, operational infrastructure is different. Sometimes the way, you know, the way we create you know, the, the Amway business opportunity is different. And so individuals uh, in those markets have to find the ways to operate in the environment in which they're, they're living. Um, but the, the cause, if you will, the, the characteristics that you need to think about or that you need to exhibit or that you need to, to demonstrate and communicate are very similar. And, and so I think we can learn from other markets and, and from other parts of the world and to say, hey, what works there largely can work here, wherever you may live, whatever you may be doing. And so, uh, you know, so I don't think there's you know, huge differences in what it looks like. So what you have to do is, is continue to stay strong in your beliefs, continue to move forward. You know, how you assess risk and take risk and how you operationalize it in India or in any other market around the world will look different. You know, I know that in India it's a very competitive marketplace. It's very, you know, very challenging and, and, and meeting the right, you know, the, the right spot for the consumer and, and, and uh, getting them what they need is, is a challenge. So there are viewers that are probably in dozens of countries watching. If you got a question, we'll get to you from Ukraine. But can you give me an example? of a practice that you learned in America that you applied to China, or a practice that you learned in China that you applied to India, or something that you learned in Britain that you applied to Germany. Something that they can grab onto, where it worked in one country and you're able to bring it to another. You, you know, that's to a certain extent, that's the story of our business. We started out as, you know, Amway, the American way, when we started in 1959. When, when we first expanded to Canada, we thought we would have to name the company something different. We thought of naming it Canway, the Canadian way. It, you know, we decided not to do that. And could you imagine, after being in you know, all the countries we are around the world, how confusing that would be today? But what we found is that, you know, that the entrepreneurial spirit, like I said, is largely similar. But you can learn from every market about how to do it. So what you learn in a market like China that you apply to India, these are huge, huge uh, markets with young populations, uh, how we have to operate in big cities. We started in the United States, it was largely rural. We started in Michigan in the Midwest. But when we moved to, you know, to Asia, so to speak, when we started out in Hong Kong or we went to England and we started out in London, you know, now how do you operate in a big city? 
So we learned that there's things we have to do differently with, with that type of consumer or that type of environment. And we applied it to different markets. So, you know, the China and India experience are both. We learn from each other. Both markets are learning from each other. They're very dynamic economies, growing economies, very competitive economies. And, and so we try to learn back and forth that we have to be faster with our, you know, with, with our product introductions, with our responses to market changes and, and things of that nature. So we're trying to learn from every market around the world and every market teaches us something. And while there's large similarities, there's, there's lessons we are constantly learning uh, about how to operate. In Japan, you, you have to have quality. People, you know, they demand it at a, at a level that is very different than other markets of the world. Um, and so, and, and in Korea, you, you have to be determined uh, to continue to work through, you know, these are great characteristics and skills that we learn from different markets that we apply around the world. We've got a question from Ukraine. What if you want to be an entrepreneur, but you don't have a dream you're passionate about? And I want to add to that question, mm. and this is a challenge. Yeah. Not everyone is suited to be an entrepreneur. Right. Isn't that correct? That is correct. While the, that while, was a good Marco Rubio imitation. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, correct. I mean, there's, as we talked about earlier, there, there are certain characteristics about an individual that drive them in this way. But if you don't have those characteristics, then that's okay. It's, we, we didn't do this study to compare good and bad or to compare success or lack of success. We, we did it just to unpack a little bit about this area so we can learn more about it. So if you, if you want to be an entrepreneur but you don't have a dream well, or you don't have you know, something that's driving you, think of some of the other things. Do you, you, know, do you, do you want to be independent? Do you, do you want to, you know, is there something inside you that wants to be your own boss? Well, focus on those characteristics then. You may not have a big dream or, or, or a big uh, goal that you've set out there, but you just don't want somebody else to tell you what to do. <laughs> you know, or you just, you, you just feel you want to go on your own path. Or, or Well, then, then maybe those sorts of characteristics uh, are the things you want to focus on. Or, or you see a market opportunity and, and you think something can happen. You don't have to have a big dream to do this. Or you just decide, I want to be an entrepreneur in the, in the organization I'm operating in. So what we do at, at our company at Amway, we have a lot of entrepreneurs that are employees that work for us. They think of new product ideas. They think of new operational ideas. They think of improvements that we can make all the time. They, they are very entrepreneurial uh, in their characteristics. They've just chosen to apply it inside a big company. And there's a lot of that that goes on around the world as well. So not, uh, on the flip side, not everybody with those entrepreneurial characteristics heads out on their own. Many times people will take those, you know, that, that desire and they'll be more in the, hey, I want to create this product or I want to go in that direction rather than I want to be my own boss. They're like, I'm okay working as part of a team and an organization and doing that. I don't want to be the leader of the whole thing. I just want to lead this part. Great. You know, I, I think that there's an important piece when we discuss this, the entrepreneurial report around the world, that we're just try we're trying to unpack this piece, but all pieces of our economy, all pieces of our life are important and have value. A and so I, I think you don't have to feel like there's anything wrong with you if you don't have a dream. Don't worry about it. Uh, you know, what do you have? What do you want? Uh, whatever it is, pursue that. A and, uh, and, you know, and, and you'll be just fine. I'm not just a moderator, I am a fan. But as a fan, I still want to know, because sometimes I learn from people's failures as much as yeah. I learn from their successes. You're one of America's, you're one of the globe's greatest entrepreneurs. But where did you get it wrong? Just give us one example of a decision or a process that you thought would succeed and it didn't work out the way you thought. Gosh. Well, you know, where do you want to start? <laughs> you know, we sometimes we, we joke, you know, and say Amway would be really great if we ever figured it out. <laughs> you know, that because there's so much to learn. 
every business, there's so much to learn. So where have we mistakes? We've made mistakes. So we've created incentive programs. We created an incentive program that was so complicated that after we launched it and implemented it, nobody succeeded. <laughs> right? So zero. So we didn't do it. And on the other side, we created another incentive program that, that was complicated, but people succeeded. So when somebody succeeded, they say, I don't know what I did, but they, you know, Amway just sent me more money. <laughs> you know, I just did the same thing. Well, we wanted them to do something different. So, so sometimes you miss how you connect with a, a product idea or, or a business idea that you think will impact the market or an individual to change their behavior in this way because you feel that that's more successful. Um, where, you know, where we've tried to do that and we've missed the mark. Um, and, and so, you know, so we're, what we're trying to do is then you know, be a little bit more thoughtful and, and rather than try to predetermine what we want somebody to do, let's predetermine an outcome and see what they'll do to get there. And, and as long as they're in the right parameters of, of running a fair and honest and you know, honorable you know, business and doing things right you know, to, to get to that level of success, we're, we had to rethink you know, how structured we wanted to cre you know, make these incentives. Um, or to, or you know, we've learned to kind of go back and say, here's the rules of the road, follow the rules of the road, but, and, and here's the goal, and when you get there, you know, here's the incentive, and then see, see what happens. We learn so much. We have you know, um, product uh, demonstrations that we never would have thought of at the company that people in our sales force think of. It's the most creative ways to demonstrate a product or to sell a product. It, it's amazing. And the talents and skills that we find if we just spend more time listening. So, uh, so there's a couple of examples where we've gotten it wrong. The internet is becoming more and more important. More than one out of every four items for Christmas will be purchased on the internet. Right. To be successful as an entrepreneur in 2015, must it be internet based? Well, I, don't, I wouldn't limit it to say it has to be internet-based um, because there's a lot of transactions that happen that are not internet-based, uh, but technology is opening up a huge range of opportunity. Um, and it certainly is something that can be considered. Uh, you know, in the 90s when, when e-commerce was first starting and from an Amway perspective or an industry perspective in direct selling, we looked at it we thought, wow, what an incredible way to help the individual. So we saw it as a way we can apply technology to our business so that our, our independent business owners can be so much more successful. They can have so much more power in their hands. It's not just a big computer in, their, in the room at headquarters, but the power that they have in their hands could help them tremendously. Um, so I think it's certainly something that uh, any entrepreneur wants to consider how technology applies but it depends on your situation. Um, you know, technology can open a lot of doors, but if that's not what you want to do, if you're into a service business, if you're into something that wants to be more local, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's not where you have to go, like anything. It's, it's, it, it expands to the range of options and opportunities that could be available to you that you should consider and look at because, you know, the power that you have in a smartphone is, is a, tremendous, uh, a tremendous power and it's not something to be taken lightly. So we're thinking the same thing. Yeah. When, you, when you look at this yeah. as an entrepreneur, what do you see? Well, you see opportunity. You, you, you see, you know, you see you know, I, I see the opportunity for a consumer to have many more choices, to be able to evaluate more choices. I see the, op the opportunity for a business owner uh, to be able to do things more, uh, more efficiently, more effectively, uh, more productively. Uh, you see, you know, Productivity to be able to be increased dramatically. Uh, you know, you see the world in your hands. You, you, you know, you see the power that technology brings brought to the individual. And to me, that should unleash the individual to be able to identify and pursue more opportunity. Uh, but, but again, as the last question said, you know, you got to figure out how that works. Were you always this optimistic when you were a kid? Did you know that this is <laughs> that life was going to be this good, that you were going to challenge life every day? You know... Were you um, born with this? I don't know if I was born with it, and that's, a, that's an interesting part of the study as well, that I grew up in an atmosphere 
where it seemed everywhere I looked, people were talking like this. You know, so, you know, I, I grew up listening to my mom and dad talk about aspects of the Amway business and how they had overcome challenges. And, and one of the things we joke about at Amway is we don't have problems, we just have challenges. Problem seems like you're stuck. A challenge seems like you just got to work through it. And, and those are the words and those are the attitudes that were communicated to me. And, and so, I, and I think it's important for us to consider that. How we speak about things, how, you know, like my example earlier of the reporter that just focused all around the economic crisis. Uh, how you speak about things or the atmosphere that you create for your employees, for your family, for your friends, it matters. And, and when you create a positive atmosphere, uh, it has an impact. So I grew up, everywhere I looked, people were positive. Everywhere I looked, people said, you can do it. You can be successful. Set your goals on that. And, and if you fail, pick yourself back up and go do it again. And, and so I was very blessed in that respect. I had a question from Korea. What entrepreneurs have inspired you? Boy, you know, um, you, know you, you look around the world. I got to start with the entrepreneurs I grew up with, <laughs> you know, in the Amway business. My dad, Jay Van Andel, you know, that was my experience. I looked at many people involved in the Amway who've started their own Amway business who've been doing it for generations. It, you know, they inspire me. They have gone through tough times. They have stayed with us through those times. I looked at people that, you know, I, you, you, you look at... Uh, you look at a Thomas Edison, you look at those great inventors, you look at those great thinkers, you, you, you see you know, the, the Bill Gates and, and, and other you know, innovators or entrepreneurs who've taken that idea and just driven it to, to wonderful heights. I look at innovators in sports that thought of new ways, you know, coaches and leaders that thought of new ways to, to do things or music or whatever it is. You know, um, you know, new trends that happen in our life that we accept as, um, a as the norm because they may have happened before we were born, but somebody invented that. You know, somebody created this. A and what we're doing right now, this, the, the technological advances, I admire the people who've made technology better along the way and brought it to more people. Uh, because that's just empowered more people to, to be able to be more productive and do more with their lives. And, and so, uh, so those are the sorts of entrepreneurs that, that come to mind you know, as admiring. And, and, and there's so many others that I can't identify. Um, those are the folks that I, you know, I, I said earlier, when I drive down a, a rural street uh, you know, in Michigan and I see a, a small restaurant or I see a small manufacturing facility. I admire those people. I don't know them. Unfortunately, I don't. Um, but I admire what they're doing because I know what they've gone through uh, to achieve that level of success. I know what they, how they thought about you know, taking personal risk, mortgaging their own home so they could buy a new piece of equipment. I admire those people. Um, and, and I think we all should. Uh, they're the backbone of our economy, and they provide opportunity for millions and millions. I know that people ask, is there any TV show to watch? Maybe Shark Tank. <laughs> uh, is there any book that they should read? If they want to follow up from this chat, we've got about 10 minutes to go. Okay. If they want to follow up with something written or something they can find on YouTube or something on television, where would you tell them to go? You, you know, I would, I would tell them to, you know, you know I... I that's a, that's a really good question because I, I, I don't know exactly where they should go in their, in, in their world. I, I think they've got to find that out. I think researching it, whether it's a show that's going to be delivered to you on television or you go on the web and you kind of find the entrepreneurs or you walk around your town and talk to the entrepreneurs. As I said, you don't have to find Bill Gates and have an interview with him. Talk to the, to the restaurant owner down the street. Talk to, 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 you know, to people in your community that you see. Just go and meet with them. Com you know, find them, identify them, and, and learn from them. They're everywhere. Uh, and, and they don't have to be prepackaged for you in, in a media campaign. You can go out and find these people. They'll talk to you. They'll tell you what they've gone through. They'll encourage you. Um, you, know, uh, you know, one of the loneliest roles is that of a leader in a company, especially a small business. They have nobody to talk to. So they'd be happy to, I bet. So that's where I would go. I would, I would go find those people and do it, do it personally. You, know, you can always do research on the web and, and that as well, but finding the people around you personally who've done it or are doing it, uh, and even those who failed uh, would be good people to start with. 
We've got a question from Australia. What role is entrepreneurship playing in reducing poverty in developing countries? Well, it's, it's huge. You, you know, if you go back to you know, Muhammad Yusnus in, in, uh, Yunus from the, the Grauman Bank, and uh, he, he spoke at a conference I was at a number of years ago and how, you know, just the, the smallest opportunity with, with you know, $20, $30 invested in a village with a, a group of people who were doing just something simple can change the whole course of that village and can take it on a new you know, trajectory. And, and to, you know, to me, I, I believe that's the answer. It's, it's, I believe that starting from the bottom up uh, is, is how poverty is going to be overcome. It, it, people are going to take themselves out of poverty, they're going to find a new way, and and I think it's up to the leaders in, in, in the global economy or political leaders to create the environment. To think that you know that a global leader can go down and make someone successful, I think, is a fallacy. You know, in our business, we create the environment, and there have been times where you see somebody, oh boy, they're going to be successful, and they're not. And you see somebody else, you're going to go, I don't know if they could ever be successful, and they the one, they're the ones that are. This is not a choice of picking winners and losers of success or failure. This is creating an environment where everyone can succeed by their own merit, by their own diligence, by their own hard work, by their own initiative, by their own creativity. That's what's going to happen. Now, you may need, you know, then you're going to need somebody like uh, Muhammad Yusuf or the Grauman Bank to, to say, hey, I, I'm going to see how I can get some financial capital, $20, $30 available to somebody and make a difference. Well, that's, that's entrepreneurial. And, and so that connected to what somebody wants to do uh, in, you know, to find their way out is, is a, huge, a huge element. So we got a question from Brazil. How is entrepreneurship different today than it was 10 years ago or going back 50 years when your father started Amway? But that's only half the question. I want you to put on your crystal ball, and I want you to tell me if we sit in this same studio 10 years from now, based on everything that you see, what will we be talking about? You, you know, so I'll, I'll, I'll go through, and I, I think the entrepreneurship that, um, that was around when, when my dad and Jay started Amway, uh, that entrepreneurial spirit, um, you know, kind of, it was, it was you know, right after World War II, right after, you know, you know a global conflict that they kind of found their way through, there was this, positivity, this you can do it atmosphere. And, and, and so I think it's the atmosphere that changes as opposed to the entrepreneurial spirit. So the, the characteristics of, of an entrepreneur uh, remain similar, uh, I think, around the world and over time. Those characteristics of self-determination, desire to be independent, the, you know, the creativity and the, that sort of element that an individual has, those sorts of characteristics uh, remain consistent and similar over time and around the world. I think what changes is the environment that allows those characteristics to be demonstrated and, and to be shown in the marketplace in such a way that, that they can, you know, they can uh, show themselves as, you know, as being successful or, or creating it. So it gets back to the environment that's created in, in an overall sense, the atmosphere of positivity and, and looking towards the future. And, and then from a, you know, a very real sense of a regulatory sense or the legal sense, what's, what are the, the barriers that are put in place along the way to hold somebody back? So I think, I, I think that the difference of 50 years ago, I think there were fewer of those barriers. There was a better atmosphere, fewer of those barriers. I think today there's more of those barriers and more than there were probably 10 years ago, whether it's Brazil or the U.S. or anywhere around the world. And, and my concern is that, is that if we don't have a discussion and if we don't raise this up, that that trend would continue. Our hope of having this discussion and doing this study is that we bring it to a higher level so people will say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Let's not just regulate for regulation's sake. Let's really think about the impact this is having. Is there an unintended consequence that's part of this, that we should reconsider our work? Of course you need regulation to keep the marketplace safe, protect consumers, of course. But to really be thoughtful about what it is and what impact it's going to have on somebody that's just starting their business, 
our hope is that this discussion will, will spark a review and, and will help people be more thoughtful uh, uh, about that topic. So you've got thousands of people watching from dozens of countries. We talked a little bit earlier about government. In the last few minutes, I believe that you believe that government often gets in the way, mm -hmm. that often makes things more difficult. So they're looking for advice from you. Is there any kind of consistent message that you can provide them for how to deal with government officials who don't respect entrepreneurship and don't appreciate it and don't try to make it easier for people? Yeah. Well, you know, there, there's a, you know, a couple things. One, you can't just fight against it. You know, just fighting isn't going isn't to gonna help. You, you have to respect the role of, of government. But I think you can get engaged in policy and you can you can raise these issues and start this discussion exactly like we're doing now and, and, and communicate it as best you can with somebody to say, you know, hey, do you understand what this means to us and, the, and how this is stopping or stifling, you know, uh, you know uh, people helping themselves moving forward. So, you know, the role that government has, you know, when you create a safe environment, that's huge. Government's got to do that. You, need, you know, you need to provide public safety. You know, you, you need to provide, you know, a, a, a range of consumer protections so that you prevent fraud so people can trust business and operations. You need to have a legal environment where you can have a contract that matters. Those are roles that government has to, to put in place. You need to have, you know, currency back and forth, being able to, to buy, sell, and count on, you know, uh, uh, on, you know, using currency as a way to transact business. So those are the things that have to happen. But the biggest piece I'd say for folks is get involved, pay attention, and when something is wrong, start the conversation. Last question, because we're just about out of time. And this comes from the US. What one tip would you give an aspiring entrepreneur? Uh, do it. <laughs> you know, my, my tip is, you know, do it. Don't, don't just think about it. Um, if you're an aspiring entrepreneur, you know, go do it. You know, um, you're not going to have all the questions answered. You're not going to have all the risks identified and overcome before you start. To a certain extent, you got to you got to be thoughtful. You got to have a plan. You don't want to just go out and get you know run over or fail immediately. But then again, you can't be so afraid of failure that you don't start. You, you, you're, and you're going to have challenge, and you may have failure. Start again. Learn from it. Keep learning and keep moving forward. So, you know, I, I'd say you got to get started. The, the biggest, the biggest um, burden with the fear of failure and with fear itself is that it just stops you from doing anything. Uh, and, and once you're stopped from doing anything, it's going to be hard to be successful. So, uh, you know, if you have, if you have that, uh, you know, that desire, act on it. Uh, be responsible, be thoughtful, you know, put together the best plan you can, but you're not going to get all the I's dotted and T's crossed. Take action. And communicate it. You're yeah. one of the most passionate corporate leaders I know. Yeah. I've seen you on stage without any notes, having this conversation for an hour without any notes yeah. is distinct and it's special. And the thing that I would say to people who are watching, having been involved with Amway for a number of years, is that if you're passionate about it, let that passion show, yeah. that people respond to you. They appreciate the emotion. They appreciate the intensity. It's a positive, not yeah. a negative. Yeah. And the second thing I would also emphasize, and you said it here, is that not every hour is great, and not every day is good, yeah. but you have great weeks, great months, and awesome years. That as an entrepreneur, and I've lived this in my life, I have no regrets. Yeah. Because I got a chance to try for everything I wanted and the idea that I could live a life of no regrets, which was taught to me by Amway, yeah. by an 18-year-old girl who got up and spoke in front of 14,000 people. Yeah. And when I asked her, why, why was she there? Why was this a commitment she was making at 18? She said that she did not ever want to look back at the decisions that she didn't make. Yeah. It's wonderful. That's fabulous, isn't it? Yeah. So I want to thank you. Thanks, Frank. I want to thank all of you for tuning in, and I hope that you found this productive. And I urge you, go on YouTube, uh, look through the web, and check out Amway. Because if you're looking to do something unique and special in your life, 
It's a great way to do it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, everybody.